former Under Secretary of Commerce for Economic Affairs and was an advisor to the International Monetary Fund. He has his degrees from the University of Chicago and Harvard. And Dr. Shapiro has done rigorous research recently documenting the subsidies associated with, with the Postal Service's letter mail monopoly. Good to see you again. Thank you for coming. Looking forward to your remarks. Thank you. Glad to meet you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, before I begin, let me say I enjoyed your presentation and found, even though we're not always in agreement, um, I particularly found the notion of um, the Postal Service as a data collector in the middle mile, middle mile very intriguing, uh, very innovative thing. Um, before I talk about the organization and operations of the Postal Service, let me say first uh, that I support without equivocation its mission to provide universal mail delivery. My concerns don't involve those traditional public functions, but rather how efficiently they can be carried out and how the Postal Service operates in competitive markets. As an economist, I readily recognize the business model of the Postal Service as an example of monopoly cross-subsidies, cross in which an organization leverages some of the legal monopoly benefits and assets associated with, in this case, the Universal Service Mission for First Class Mail to create advantages in its competition with private companies in other areas, and that would be package delivery and express mail. It's simple to think of the Postal Service as an organization with two divisions. One operates the monopoly on first class and standard mail, supported by subsidies and exclusive rights, and the other focuses on package and express mail deliveries in competition with FedEx, UPS, and others. Let me also mention that in the past, I advised both UPS and the Postal Regulatory Commission on these matters. I also don't blame the Postal Service for its cross-subsidies. Many of the subsidies themselves are perfectly reasonable because its universal mail delivery services operate under legal requirements that raise costs and, re and uh, dampen productivity. For example, the Postal Service has to maintain underused postal, post offices, we heard some of that, and it has to charge mass mailers and others with congressional cloud special or lower rates. Uh, we know how this has worked out. The Postal Service ran a deficit of $8.8 .8 billion last year, double its 2018 losses, with some explanations, which we've heard. It is the 13th consecutive year of losses. These losses largely reflect the shrinking market for first class mail, those congressional mandates, and the inefficiencies that are common, one might say, economists like me would say ubiquitous, to monopolies. Um, monopolies are never efficient. Uh, if you support universal mail service as I do, I believe you should also accept that a public service deserves and needs public support. We should, I believe, return to public appropriations to make up any shortfalls in first class mail delivery and end congressional mandates that don't directly support that mission. No more special rates for mass mailers, nor for that matter for political mail. With the steadily and fast rising use of email for communications that used to rely on first class mail, think of all your bills, uh, we should also let the Postal Service move to five day weekly mail deliveries. Congress should stop getting in the way of the Postal Service and the Postal Regulatory Commission in closing redundant post offices. The Postal Service can then use attrition to bring to better align its workforce with labor requirements under the new terms. So those labor requirements would increase if we followed uh, the data collection uh, proposal we just heard, and that would be fine. A leaner and more efficient Postal Service can sustain universal mail delivery. My other focus today is the relationship 
between those universal service functions and the postal service's current role in the commercial market for package deliveries. The heart of the issue lies in the ways the postal service applies its monopoly rights and assets to that market. When the postal service wields cross subsidies, for example, using its mailbox monopoly for packages as well as first class mail, using the workers who deliver that mail to deliver packages at the same time, at using the same vehicle storage and sorting operations paid for by its subsidized monopoly division. When it does all that, it's behaving like any private business. Businesses keep prices high when consumers have few or no alternatives, and prices low when customers can easily go elsewhere. That's what happens here. The Postal Service uses its monopoly rights and assets to keep package delivery prices lower because it knows that every 1% increase in those prices will reduce demand for package delivery services seven times as much as a 1% increase in the price to deliver first mail, uh, first class mail. There's no alternative but the Postal Service for first class mail. Uh, that's why the Postal Service keeps its charges to Amazon low and to FedEx and UPS for last mile delivery while raising first class mail charges 25% over the last decade, including the 10% increase last year. Now, why should we care about these cross subsidies? Well, we should because ultimately consumers and taxpayers pay for them. The cross subsidies discourage investment and innovation by both the Postal Service and by the private firms competing with their publicly subsidized rival. We also should care because efficient and innovative package delivery services are a critical part of the ever expanding and ever more important internet based economy. Yes, the Postal Service technically charges its competitive division for using its monopoly resources. But independent analysts, myself included, have demonstrated that those charges represent a modest part, certainly less than half of the actual value its package delivery division derives from using the monopoly subsidies, rights, and assets, um, which, which exist only for its public universal first class mail letter delivery obligation. And the Postal Service can use those charges, the payments it receives, in effect transfers from one division to the other, in any way it chooses, including for its competitive operations. It goes into a, an account it can draw on in any way. I also want to focus for a minute, for a paragraph, on the Postal Service's exclusive right to leave mail in a customer's curbside mailbox, and more important, in the central mail rooms of office and apartment buildings, instead of at each customer's door as private delivery firms are required to do. No one objects to letting the Postal Service do that, but there's no basis to bar private firms from doing the same with their packages. The reason usually cited security, justifies mailbox deliveries, but it doesn't justify the Postal Service's monopoly on it. That is the bar on private package delivery companies using that, using central mail, mail rooms and mailboxes, just as the Postal Service does. If it's more secure, that ability certainly should extend to packages whoever delivers them. That's why we're the only country in the world that provides that special monopoly right. Now, all of these issues are not unique. Most advanced countries have dealt with the cross subsidies and inefficiencies that appear when a monopoly mail delivery and a competitive package delivery are combined in one public entity. Virtually every European country was in the exact same situation we have been in. Most other countries have resolved these issues by spinning off package and express mail deliveries into separate private companies. 
That's what the President's Commission on the Postal Service also recommended years ago. This approach need not even take the Postal Service entirely out of the package and express mail delivery market. The private spinoff would compete with other private package and delivery firms and could pay the Postal Service the same fees for late mile, last mile delivery as other private package and express mail delivery companies do um, because it's efficient. Where would all this leave the Postal Service? We gain the right, if they think necessary, to opt for five day per week residential mail delivery on a universal basis. It could end the reduced rates for mass mailers. It could close badly underused post offices. Its charges would be based on how much the public is willing to pay for mail delivery as the customers and as the taxpayers funding any appropriation required to make up any shortfalls run by a leaner and more efficient postal service. In the end, first class mail could cost more. It could cost less. But at last, the postal service could operate on an economically and politically sound business model. Thank you.